Welcome to part two of my lecture series on Ri and Chow type interpolation. In part one, in the last episode, we looked at checkerboard oscillations and how they can arise on a co-located grid if we're not careful with the type of interpolation scheme that we used. I also mentioned two different methods that we can use for avoiding these checkerboard oscillations. The first being using a staggered grid and the second being Ri and Chow type interpolation. In this talk, I'm going to be looking at staggered grids first so that you really understand the foundation for how these methods can be used to avoid the checkerboard oscillations. And then once we've understood what a staggered grid is and how it works, next lecture we're going to look at Ri and Chow interpolation method itself and we're going to derive the equation itself from first principles so that you really understand it. Now for part two, I really think you're going to enjoy this talk as well, because as well as looking at staggered grids and understanding them, we're also going to be looking a little bit at the history of CFD codes so that we understand how they were developed and why and where staggered grids and re and Chow type interpolation uh, methods appear in the overall development of CFD codes over the past uh, 50 years. So I think you're going to find this talk surprisingly interesting and you're going to learn a lot from it. Let's get into it. So before we jump into today's talk, I just want to do a quick bit of signposting because I know this could cause some issues if I don't quickly mention it before we start the talk. I'm going to be talking a lot today about co-located grids and staggered grids. Now, these are methods that are used internally by the CFD code to set up and solve uh, the Navier-Stokes equations. This is not a meshing option. So don't be confused and think that this is a type of mesh or a type of grid that you need to make when you're using your meshing software. This is at some internal algorithms that are used by the CFD code. So carry on, you make your mesh as normal, but when you give it to the CFD code, inside the code, it will either treat it as a co-located grid or a staggered grid. So this isn't something you need to worry about. It's not a method or an option in your meshing software. Just be aware that this is something that goes on inside the CFD code. And so normally you wouldn't need to know how to do it, but for our talk and understanding the uh, checkerboard oscillations, it's important that we understand what's going on behind the scenes. So what I want to do before introducing staggered grids is just to give you a brief reminder of co-located grids. Now, in a co-located grid, these are the grids which you'll be most used to seeing these days in CFD codes. All of the flow variables, so pressure, velocity, temperature, uh, turbulent kinetic energy, uh, specific dissipation rate, all of these flow variables are calculated and solved at the cell centroids. So when you pass your mesh to the CFD code, the centroid of that cell, that's the location where the flow variables are solved for. And of course, between the flow between these cell centroids, the flow variables vary linearly between those points at best. Now, all of the mainstream CFD codes that you'll be used to using nowadays, so OpenFoam, Fluent, Star CCM, all of these codes use uh, co-located grids. So this is internally what the CFD code is doing. It's going to be calculating and solving pressure, velocity, temperature, and all the other variables at the centroids of the cells of the mesh that you give the CFD code. So if the majority of CFD codes use co-located grids, why am I talking to you about staggered grids today? Why do you even need to know about staggered grids? If this is an option that isn't used by CFD codes, why do we care? Why are we interested? Well, staggered grids are important if you want to understand the Ri and Chow type interpolation that we're going to be going through in detail next lecture. So it's really important that you understand staggered grids because they form the foundation uh, of the technique used by Ri and Chow in their interpolation scheme. So really this talk is just for understanding so that you can get more out of part three of this lecture series. Now in a staggered grid, what's very, the key point which you need to take away from a staggered grid is that in the same way as a co-located grid, all of the flow variables are calculated and stored at the cell centroid, so pressure, temperature, curb, turbulent kinetic energy, etc., except for velocity. Velocity is treated differently in a staggered grid. And the velocity is calculated and stored not at the cell centroids, but at the center of the faces. And so I've got a small diagram for you on the slide to illustrate that. The top picture is just an image of a, of a 1D mesh. Think of that as a, a bar or a rod or a channel in 1D. 
and the, the black circles indicate the cell centroids. And at those cell centroids, you calculate uh, pressure, temperature, turbulent kinetic energy, etc. But that's not where the velocity is calculated and stored. The velocity is calculated and stored uh, on the cell faces. And they're shown in my bottom diagram as the white circles. Now, because the velocity is calculated and stored at the cell faces, you can think of this as a separate grid that's staggered on top of the original pressure grid, it's often called. And you can see that in the diagram there. You can think of drawing a control volume around the face so that that face center becomes the cell centroid of this new staggered grid that's staggered relative to the original grid. Now that all makes sense in 1D, but in 2D you need to be quite careful when thinking about this staggered grid. Now the image you can see there on the slide is just a grid of 4 by 4 2D cells and the blue squares underneath the diagram, they're representing the original grid where pressure, temperature uh, and turbulent kinetic energy, for example, are calculated and stored. But the way that we stagger the grid, you need to think quite carefully about this, is we're not moving the cell diagonally. What we're actually doing is for the U-momentum grid, we shift the cell to the left. And you can see that in the diagram on the right. But for the V-momentum grid, we're shifting the cell upwards. And so you need to be very careful here and don't get confused. We're not doing a diagonal shift. We do separate shifts along the X and the Y axis. And of course, if we had a 3D grid, we'd be shifting along the Z axis for the W momentum. So the staggering is not diagonal. And so this raises a very important point when you're understanding staggered grids, is that each of the components of velocity effectively have their own grid. So because the U-momentum grid or the X-momentum grid is shifted left to right, the V-momentum grid is shifted up and down, it means that actually we have a total of three grids in 2D. And we have four grids in 3D. So when people say a staggered grid, really you need to be thinking there are multiple grids staggered on top of each other. And you can see that quite simply there on the slide. Now there's an interesting implication of this staggering because we're staggering the U grid left to right and the V grid up and down, what happens is that you have half cells at the ends of these grids. So for the U momentum grid, you can see in the middle there, because we're shifting that original grid of four cells by half a unit to the right, that final cell at the right of the mesh ends up being half cell thickness. And then the cell on the left, the new cell that's uh, inserted there to replace it is also half a cell thick. So we have these interesting half cells on the edges of our staggered grid. And we see a similar thing for the V momentum grid. We have these interesting half cells at the top and bottom of the staggered grid in 2D. So they're very interesting and have some uh, interesting implications in some of the maths that follow. Now, if you were to write a CFD code for one of these staggered grids, you need to think quite carefully about your index notation or how you identify a given cell in the mesh. And if you have a co-located grid and it's a structured grid, like most CFD codes to use, this will be fairly simple and straightforward to do. So you could have a sort of an IJ index notation scheme, for example. In the example here I've given you, I'm, no, I'm numbering my indices zero to five along the X axis and then zero to five along the Y axis. And using that sort of index notation, you could easily pick out the cell that you want. But how does this differ with a staggered grid? Clearly with a staggered grid, we're gonna to have to think a little bit more carefully about our index notation and also keep a record of what grid we're actually on when we're setting up and solving the equations. Well, the example I've got for you here on the slide is just the U momentum grid again. So just a reminder, we've taken that original grid, which we had the pressure and temperature and turbulent kinetic energy, and we've shifted it half a cell to the left and this has some interesting implications for the node numbering. And because we've shifted left to right, there's no change to the node numbering along the Y axis, but you'll notice on the X axis, we've actually changed the number of nodes there that we're going to be uh, calculating and keeping a record of. And this time the node, ind the node indices don't go from zero to five, but we actually have two options. The node indexing can either go from one to five or it can go from zero to four. 
And this is a choice that's open to the CFD code. So if you were to write this as your own CFD code, you'd have to choose whether to use forward staggering or backward staggering. And that's gonna have some uh, implications for some of the terms which we'll see later. But already you can start to see with a, with a staggered grid, you're gonna to have to be a lot more careful in how you number your cells and how you identify various cells on the various meshes that you have now. For example, if you were looking at a particular cell for the U-momentum, you'd need to know what grid you were on, you'd need to know whether you were forward or backward staggering, and then you'd need to be able to locate that cell in the mesh by using the I and J index notation for that grid. Now, what I'm gonna show you is so far, we've just been through a bit of a setup of the staggered grid so that you understand what it is and some of the uh, interesting implications that are there when you decide to code a staggered grid up for yourself. But what we really care about in this talk is why does a staggered grid uh, help avoid those checkerboard oscillations that we went through in part one? And what we're going to see is that actually, regardless of whether the CFD code chooses to use a forward or a backward staggering for the index notation, the staggered grid is always able to avoid these checkerboard oscillations. And the reason that it's able to do that is because the velocity is stored on the cell faces of the original grid rather than at the centroids. This is the key point, is that we've shifted the velocity, so we're now solving in terms of the velocity on those cell faces. And the reason that the staggered grid allows us to avoid those checkerboard oscillations can be really clearly seen when we now look at the pressure gradient, which we're gonna do now. So what I want you to do for this example is once again, consider a very simple grid. We've just got a grid of four cells in 1D, and you can see that on the right, that's the original grid, where, which you're probably used to. You calculate and store the pressure, the temperature, turbulent kinetic energy, and all the other flow variables at the cell centroids there in the black circles. And of course, with a staggered grid approach, we'd shift that grid half a cell uh, to the right, and that ends up with us having half cells on either ends of the mesh. And the uh, U velocity or the U momentum will be calculated and stored on the faces of that original mesh, which correspond to the centroids of this U staggered grid, which you'll see here. And what we would do now is we'd set up and, so and write the uh, momentum equations. Remember that we have a separate equation for U, V, and W, and then an equation for the pressure correction and any other uh, scalars that we're solving for. The trick here is that we write the U momentum in terms of the index notation and the grids for that staggered grid, for the U grid you can see there on the left. And for the pressure correction equation, the temperature equation, uh, energy, turbulent kinetic energy, we'd write all of those equations for the original grid on the right. And what you'll remember is when we write a momentum equation in discrete form, as we did uh, in part one of this lecture series, what we do is we apply the finite volume method and we discretize each of the terms in that partial differential equation over a cell. And of course, as we're applying the U momentum equation to the staggered grid, it would be integrated over the cell on that staggered grid. And one of the interesting terms in the momentum equation is the pressure gradient. And this is the one we're gonna focus on here. And what we would have to do when we discretize that uh, pressure term in the momentum equation is to write the pressure gradient in discrete form for this staggered cell. And what you can see there on the left is just a, a diagram to show what this looks like. Now remember that all the flow variables vary linearly at best across your cells. And so you'd, probably, you'd be interested in the pressure gradient dpdx at the centroid of this staggered cell, which you can see there. And because the pressure gradient varies uh, linearly across the cell, the way you can calculate it at the centroids, that pressure gradient dpdx, of course, is to take the pressures at the far ends of that cell, so p at one end minus p at the other end, and then divide by the distance across the cell. Because for this example here, all of the cells are perfect rectangles, so we don't need to worry about any changes in shape. We can just take the pressure at one end, the pressure at the other end, and divide by the distance. Now the key point here in uh, the staggered grid method and why the staggered grid is able to avoid the checkerboard oscillations is to remember that actually, because we're on the staggered cell, the pressure at one end of that cell 
actually corresponds with the pressure at the centroid on that original mesh. And likewise, the pressure at the other end of our staggered cell, PI, I've called it here in the diagram, corresponds with the pressure at the centroid of the original mesh. And you can see that in the diagram there on the right hand side where I've superimposed the original mesh and the staggered mesh on top of each other. And so we can write this pressure gradient as PI plus one minus PI. So I remember is the index notation uh, for the pressure going along the X axis. And there's a difference of one there. Now, as I introduced before, when I was talking about forwards and backwards staggered grids, uh, we'd have to change the index notation slightly if we were using a forwards or a backwards staggered grid. Because if we have a forward staggered grid, then the node on the right will be I plus one, whereas the node on the left will be I. Whereas if we had a backward staggered grid, as you've seen before, the node on the right would be PI and the node on the left would be PI I minus one. But either way, we generate this equation uh, for the pressure gradient across that staggered U momentum cell, which you can see there in the diagram. And what you'll notice just by looking at that equation is regardless of whether we choose forward staggering or backward staggering, regardless of how we choose to do that shift when we're shifting the cells by half a cell along the axis, you can see that the pressure gradient depends on the pressure in the cells on either side. So you've got a difference of one there in the index notation. And what I want you to do is to think back to the pressure gradient in the talk that we gave in part one of this lecture series, where we had uh, the co-located grid. And you'll remember that the pressure gradient was actually given by the pressure in either side of the cell we were interested in. So we had PI plus one minus PI minus one. So we actually had that, that difference in where the pressure was being calculated and stored two cells apart. And that's why we've got the two delta X on the bottom. And if you'll remember back, this was actually one of the causes of the checkerboard oscillations because we could have two independent solutions for the pressure field, each uh, two cells away uh, from, the, from the cell before. And that would allow us to get this uh, oscillation uh, solution to appear under some circumstances. But if you just compare equation two with equation three, you can see that in equation two, the pressure gradient is depending on the pressure in the cells next to it. So these two independent solutions are no longer permissible. And that really is the core of the staggered grid, how just in the method that you've used to set up and do your index notation, so be being very careful what indices you use and how you arrange the variables, that's actually the mechanism that inherently allows you to avoid the checkerboard oscillations themselves. So at a glance, this appears like a very simple and small modification that we could use to the CFD code to prevent these harmful oscillations. But as I spoke to you about at the start of the talk, you may remember that the majority of CFD codes like OpenFoam and Fluent don't use this staggered grid approach. They do something different. So this begs the question, why don't people use staggered grids? It seems like there's a very simple modification that we can do to the index notation, and this allows us to get around this difficult problem of the checkerboard oscillations. So to answer that question, what I'm gonna do is now briefly go through some of the limitations of staggered grids. And what you, we haven't gone through this uh, strictly yet, but what we'll see is that um, co-located grids, if they want to avoid checkerboard oscillations, they can only do that if we're very careful about the interpolation schemes that we use. And we're going to do, we're going to go through that in part three of this lecture series. But with staggered grids, just by the nature of their formulation and how they're set up, they can avoid the checkerboard oscillations. So why are staggered grids rarely used? Well, in order to answer this question, once again, I'm just going to give you a simple example so that you can easily understand uh, some of the limitations of the staggered grid. And what I want you to do is consider a very simple mesh on the left hand side of this figure, which you can see there. And in this mesh, we've got a total of 10 cells. We've got a block of six squares, and this is connected to four cells that are skewed at an angle, which you can see there. And this is the pressure grid or the baseline grid. And you'll remember that when we create a staggered grid, what we do for the U momentum is we shift all of those cells, half a cell to the right. And then when we create the V momentum grid, we shift the cells half a cell upwards. And what you'll see for the U momentum uh, cell straight away 
is that at the right hand end of that mesh, because we've shifted it to the right, we've now got an error. We can't take that half a cell that we've shifted to the right and then apply that at the other end of the mesh. There's clearly, there's clearly an error here and this type of mesh is not applicable to this type of geometry. And we can actually make a further deduction from this slide that I'm gonna go on to show you later, is that staggered grids can't have any skewed cells at all. So in this diagram, you can see on the left that we've got four skewed cells, and it's got quite a lot of skew in that mesh. But actually what we're gonna see is that a staggered grid can't have any skewed cells at all. Even a single skewed cell uh, will result in method breaking down and losing its validity. And what we've seen here is that staggered grids can't have any skewed cells, but I do want to point out that staggered grids can have stretched cells. This is slightly different. So up until this point, we've only been thinking about our mesh as been perfect squares. And that's clearly quite limiting because there aren't many applications when you can use a mesh of purely uniform cells. And it turns out in a staggered grid, you can stretch the cells. If you think of uh, cell stretching that you normally do close to a wall, for example, if you have a boundary layer flow or something different, you often squish, uh, squish and stretch the cells close to the wall. And with the staggered grid, because we're dividing those cells effectively in half, remember that we're considering and calculating the velocity on the cell faces, we can still shift those cells half a unit to the left and the right because we're dividing each of the cells locally in half. And hopefully you can see from the diagram here that we can, we can stretch and shift the cells uh, along the x-axis and we can also stretch and shift them along the y-axis. So this staggered grid for this uh, cell which has some compression along the, along the x-axis would still be valid for a staggered grid approach. But what does this mean? We've identified uh, a limitation of the staggered grids. They can't have any skewed cells, but they can have stretched cells. So what does this mean for us in practice? Well, in practice, it actually means that our mesh overall that we construct, if our CFD code was using a staggered grid approach internally, we'd actually be limited to a special type of mesh called a Cartesian mesh. And you may have seen Cartesian meshes spoken of in the literature or in your textbooks, and you may not have. And I just wanted to spend a few minutes just explaining what a Cartesian mesh is so you really understand the difference. Well, a Cartesian mesh is actually a special type of structured mesh. And some of you will be used to structured meshes and generating them uh, for yourself in uh, certain meshing software like uh, ISIM CFD, for example, you're able to build block structured meshes where you use uh, blocks and then you generate uh, O grids and certain types of topology uh, where the cells form a very regular structured pattern. Now, a Cartesian mesh is a special type of structured mesh. It's, you can think of it as a subset of structured meshes. So a Cartesian mesh is a structured mesh uh, but not all structured meshes are Cartesian meshes. And to help you understand this concept, what I've got for you on the slide there is just a very simple example of flow around uh, a right angle bend. And this is a fairly simple geometry to mesh. You've, you've got one corner, which you can see there in gray. And many of you, if you've meshed this before uh, in a package like ISOM, you'll notice that there are two different ways we could, we could mesh this corner region. And the mesh on the left, what you can see there, is we've split that corner region into three blocks. You can think of it like that, three blocks or three regions. Whereas the grid on the right, what we've done is we've split that corner down the middle. And what you'll notice is that, of course, both of these meshes are structured meshes, but the mesh on the left, all of the cells are squ perfect squares or perfect rectangles. They're, of course, stretched so that we get that increased resolution of the boundary layer on the corner, but none of the cells are skewed. We haven't changed the shape. Whereas the image on the right, what you'll see of course, is that some of those cells close to the corner have been skewed and their shape has been changed. And so we would not be able to use a staggered grid approach with the mesh on the right because it's not a Cartesian mesh, even though it is a structured mesh. And Another way you can think about this is what is a Cartesian mesh is that in a Cartesian mesh, all of the grid lines or the lines that define the edges of the cells are perfectly aligned with the X, Y, and Z axes, whereas they're clearly not 
in the structured mesh on the right there. And if you now take a step back and think of geometry, because geometry is ultimately what's limiting us here in our uh, staggered grid approach, is that if we have a general CFD geometry, then the moment that geometry has a single curve or a single uh, angled edge that's not perfectly 90 degrees, then we may be able to generate a structured mesh for that application, but we can't generate a Cartesian mesh. And because we can't generate a Cartesian mesh, then we can't use a staggered grid approach internally in our CFD code. If you had, for example, a, a CFD code, let's say a made up CFD code that used a staggered grid approach, and you tried to read in a mesh that wasn't a Cartesian mesh, the CFD code wouldn't allow you to run that problem. So hopefully now you can see the thought process here that actually the geometry determines the type of mesh that you can make. So if your geometry has curves or angles, you can't make a Cartesian mesh. And then the Cartesian mesh can be treated using a staggered grid approach. And I spent quite a while talking through that approach. I'm really hoping that you guys understand this concept because it's very important. And uh, 20 or 30 years ago in older CFD codes, this was actually a very common limitation of what you might do. But now, of course, jumping back to modern times and modern CFD codes, many of the applications that you'll be uh, used to using in your own CFD applications, of course, have curved surfaces and angles. So even when you think of aerofoils, wings and blades and internal geometries like diffusers, if you're using a staggered grid approach in your CFD code, you can't analyze any of these geometries. And this is clearly a massive limitation on what you can do with your CFD code. And hopefully you can start to see now why many of the modern CFD codes like Fluent, OpenFoam and Star CCM use the co-located approach because the staggered approach is clearly not possible here because you don't want to be limiting the user to a Cartesian mesh only. Now, I did want to make a small side point here that you can still use a staggered grid if your geometry is a perfect circle or a perfect cylinder. Because in this case, rather than using a Cartesian mesh, you can generate a polar mesh. And under these conditions, I just want you to think quickly about this, that you would stagger your grid along the theta axis, along the R axis, instead of along U and R, and you'd be shifting by half a cell again. So if you did have a staggered grid approach, you could still use a perfect polar mesh, but the limitation of that, of course, is you'd have to rewrite and solve the Navier-Stokes equations in polar coordinates, which is clearly a bit of a headache um, and would be quite difficult to do. So I just wanted to make that side point that if you are using a staggered grid approach, you can do uh, any meshes where the grid lines or the lines that uh, mark the edges of the cells are either aligned perfectly with the X, Y, and Z axis or the R, theta, and Z axis if you wanted to use polar coordinates. Now, I just wanted to jump in and make a small point about the timeline here and really the history of CFD code development because what I've talked about a lot through this talk so far seems to not be very applicable because it's talking about old CFD applications and none of the CFD codes nowadays seem to use this staggered grid approach. And what I want you to think about is the timeline of uh, CFD applications and algorithms that have been developed and really the first um, applications of CFD were around in the 1940s. And this is where we were using finite difference methods to solve CFD. And the staggered grid approach that I've talked about here today in this talk was introduced by Harlow and Welsh in 1965. So they were the first authors to propose shifting the U and the V momentum grids by half a cell so that we could use that to avoid the checkerboard oscillations in 1965. But at that point, we were, we were still limited to staggered grids and the approach of using a co-located grid with a Ri and Chow type terp interpolation wasn't available until 1983. So I really want you to think about the history here that if you were around in the 1960s and 1970s and you were writing your own CFD codes, you'd be stuck in that you could only look at certain geometries where you could generate a Cartesian mesh or a perfect polar mesh and perhaps you had an aerofoil application or a wing that you wanted to look at, you wouldn't be able to solve it with the techniques available. And this is part of the reason why the Ri and Chow type interpolation gets uh, is so notorious and gets such praise in the CFD community. Because when it was first proposed in 1983, it really unlocked a whole 
a whole other level of geometries and applications that the user could look at. And that's a period of 18 years if you work it out from 1965 to 1983. And of course, at this point, when it becomes available, people can start to look at aerofoils and wings and all of the other interesting applications that you're probably used to seeing in CFD codes nowadays. And of course, this may also help you to understand if you have any old CFD textbooks, um, for example, the textbook by Patanka that's uh, fairly famous in the CFD community. If you look at the date when this textbook was written, this particular textbook was written in 1980. So it's written three years before Ri and Chow published their paper. And that's why when you read some of these old CFD applications, you'll see that the methods are limited to staggered grids uh, or even finite difference methods in some cases. But of course, afterwards, when the Ri and Chow method was introduced, this allows people to start to handle curved surfaces and using uh, unstructured meshes and the more advanced techniques which you'll be used to nowadays. So at this point, you may be thinking, well, once the Ri and Chow interpolation method is introduced in 1983, surely the staggered grid approach will be shelved completely. Why is there any need to use staggered grids anymore? Why, why are they still talked about? Well, it turns out that even though the modern CFD codes like Fluent, OpenFoam and StarCCM all use the co-located approach with a Ri and Chow type interpolation uh, method in them, there are still some CFD codes nowadays that do use staggered grids. And these tend to be in more niche applications and fields. Um, one example of a CFD code, a modern CFD code that does exist that uses a staggered grid uh, is mFix. And I've left a link in the description uh, below to mFix if you're interested in checking it out or if you use it yourself. Uh, when you read through the user manual, you'll realize that mFix itself does use a staggered grid approach. And that begs an interesting question. Why do they choose to use a staggered grid when they could just use a co-located grid like most modern codes use? And what we need to do to understand the reasons why you might choose to use a staggered grid uh, is we need to just think uh, think a little bit about what's actually going on behind the scenes. And what I've got for you here on the slide is just a, a comparison of um, an unstructured grid and then a Cartesian grid on the right. Just remember that the Cartesian grid is what's used um, in the staggered grid approach. And the first thing you'll notice just with these two example meshes is that in the unstructured mesh, uh, the node numbering or the cell numbering uh, is random, that there isn't a pattern to uh, the node numbering. You may have an, a node numbering in some applications. So if you, if you had a square mesh and exported it as an unstructured mesh, there may happen to be uh, some pattern to that node numbering. But in general, how the CFD codes are written, we have to consider that there's no pattern at all to the node numbering. Whereas if you look at the Cartesian mesh where each cell is identified by an I and a J index, what you'll see is that each cell, the neighbors of that cell, which of course we're interested in for the fluxes across the surfaces, uh, they're related to the node number of that cell that we're interested in. And the pattern is very uniform. So for example, I've highlighted cell six for you here in the diagram. And what you'll see is that regardless of what cell we choose in that mesh, the cells to the left and the right of the cell we're interested in, the, uh, the overall index has just been shifted by one. And then if we look at the cells on top and the bottom, we can see that the index has shifted by four. And if we were to consider other cells in the mesh, you'd see the same pattern. So if you looked at cell seven, you could see that the cell uh, on top of cell seven is given by the same index, but minus four. So there's clearly some kind of regular pattern here that's going on with these Cartesian meshes. And that's, that's actually a big strength of the Cartesian mesh when we think about the algorithm that's going on underneath it. When you use a Cartesian mesh and you pull all of the terms together and you formulate your uh, partial differential equation using the finite volume method as a, as a matrix structure, um, you may remember from some of my earlier talks that it ends up the CFD code, uh, the partial differential equations end up being written in the form AX equals B. If we look at that A matrix, what we notice when we have a Cartesian grid is that because each of those cells, the neighbors, uh, are set distance away, ends up that the A matrix has a banded structure, has a very well-defined banded or patterned structure. And what this means when we solve the equations is that 
we can actually use uh, special algorithms like the tridiagonal matrix algorithm, which is often called the Thomas algorithm, to solve this particular equation. And this is a bit of an unusual matrix algorithm because it's limited to matrices that have very well-defined banded structures. And this algorithm in particular is extremely fast. It's very efficient at solving the matrices. Whereas when we have that unstructured mesh approach, while each individual cell is connected to its neighbors, the number of the cell number that you use to identify those neighbors is fairly random. And so you wouldn't be able to use this super fast, efficient uh, Thomas algorithm to solve the matrix structure. And there's another advantage to the Cartesian mesh, which you may have noticed that all of the cells are either going to be perfect squares or perfect rectangles because we can't have any skew at all in order to define a Cartesian mesh. We can shrink those cells so that they are high aspect ratio, but the cells themselves have no skew to them. They're perfect cells. And from some of my earlier talks, you may remember that um, skewed cells need non-orthogonal correctors and often skewness error correctors as well. And these additional correctors, they can reduce the stability of the matrix equations and make the calculations slower and more difficult to solve. And of course, you may know from some experiences that if you have a, a very poor mesh with high skewness, often that calculation is likely to diverge. So one of the strengths of a Cartesian mesh is that not only is it fast, but the mesh quality is also very high when you set them up. And so overall, what that means is that if you are using a Cartesian mesh with a staggered grid approach, the solution is very fast and very efficient. And this is why some CFD codes like MFIX nowadays still choose to use that staggered grid approach. They're clearly making the trade-off where they say, we're going to limit the user in the types of geometry that they can supply and the meshes they can create, but the benefit is that the solution is very fast and very efficient. So just to wrap up the points that I've talked about in today's talk, uh, the main points are, is that on a staggered grid, remember all of the variables stay stored and calculated at the cell centroids, except for velocity. Velocity is the only variable that shifted and it's calculated and stored on the faces of the cell. And the way that we can think of this conceptually is that there's another grid staggered around that velocity cell. And the staggered grid has a considerable advantage in that in its formulation, the pressure gradient, if you remember back when we talked about the pressure gradient, the pressure gradient across the cell is calculated from the centroids of the cells that are staggered across that cell face or you can think of it in terms of the index notation, i and i plus one. And this is the key feature of the staggered grid approach that allows us to avoid those checkerboard oscillations. And of course, the limitations of the staggered grids we talked about briefly at the end, where the mesh unfortunately has to be perfect Cartesian or polar mesh. We can't have any skewed or bad cells. And as a result, this is really limiting for the user because you can't have a geometry with any curves or angles, but it does mean that the solution, when you set that uh, solution um, going in your CFD code, the CFD code can use a very efficient algorithm. So you get a very uh, fast solution that's more likely to be stable and converge than if you were using uh, an unstructured mesh approach. So that brings me to the end of part two of my lecture series on Rian Chow type interpolation. At this stage, I feel like we've really set the stage for understanding and deriving the Rian Chow interpolation method itself in the next talk. We've looked at staggered grids and we've understood the principles of checkerboard oscillations and how they can appear uh, in CFD solutions if we're not careful. And so now in the next talk, I'm really excited. We're going to finally be looking at the Rian Chow interpolation formula itself. And now that we've understood the foundations and where it comes from, we're going to be able to derive the equation and actually understand all the terms and what they mean and why we do this type of interpolation procedure. So I'm really excited to bring you part three of this lecture series. It's going to be coming soon. Uh, let me know in the comment section, are you enjoying this uh, talk and are you excited to, to finally crack the Rian Chow uh, interpolation scheme in the next talk? Um, as always, I appreciate your continued support for the channel and uh, thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you in part three.